Hi, I'm Megan Pasaski. I'm a graduate student working in the Allset Lab at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And this is our work on electrothermal modeling of HTS power lines for cryogenically cooled electric aircraft design. First, I'll go through the Cheetah electrical system architecture to give background on the cryogenically cooled electric aircraft that our group is developing and the motivation behind the development of these multi-domain HTS models. Then I will go through the modeling of these multi-domain HTS components. I'll show the validation and simulation of these models uh, since we modeled it for hydrogen gas, liquid hydrogen, and liquid nitrogen cooling. And then I will go through our next steps for the application and integration of these models into the aircraft and the other cryogenic components that we have to model as well using this multi-domain modeling technique. So CHEETAH is a program that explores future technologies in electrified aircraft. We're developing a hybrid electric aircraft that's powered by both batteries and hydrogen fuel cells. The aircraft components are designed to be cryogenically cooled using liquid hydrogen. Here we're developing all of the models for the electric uh, aircraft design. So all of our models consist of multi-domains for mathematical modeling with some variation between what domains that we model since it's not necessary for every model that we develop. But overall in the aircraft, we're considering the electrical domain the thermal domain for liquid and gas cooling, the mechanical domain and the aerodynamics of the aircraft, and the control of all of the components in the aircraft. Here we're going to be focusing on just the modeling of the HGS power lines in the electrical and thermal domains. We develop these models using the Medallica programming language um, so that we can simulate all of these models. Here we have our electrical system architecture for Cheetah. We're considering a hybrid centralized and distributed electrical architecture. So what this means is all of the fuel cells are configured in a centralized architecture where they're generating power on centralized bus bars that are connected via tie line. The power generated by these fuel cells is sent via HTS line to the distribution bus bars. There's three distribution bus bars in the Cheetah aircraft. We have two sets of eight motors um, or drivetrains that are located in either wing and one set of four motors or drivetrains um, that are located in the body of the aircraft. The distribution, uh, distributed electrical architecture portion of Cheetah is denoted by these batteries that are connected on the distribution bus bars. We do this so that we can have a balanced aircraft weight by having the batteries located in the wings. It also adds re electrical reliability so that the batteries can generate power. If something were to happen to the HTS line or the fuel cells in flight, we can still get power to those drivetrains to propulse the aircraft. Here we have our cooling system for Cheetah. We have a few different cooling loops for the aircraft. We are cooling the HTS lines and buff bars separately from the drivetrains and fuel cells. This um, configuration ensures a stable and constant temperature applied to the components. It also protects the system to ensure maximum capability to remove heat during a fault. The motors, power electronics, and current needs contribute to most of the heat generation, so this sort of configuration makes sense. Now that I have all of the Cheetah um, background done and you guys have an idea of the aircraft model that we're working with, I'll discuss the multi-domain modeling of these HTS power lines. So the multi-domain transmission line is represented as a coaxial uh, model, cable model in the electrical domain with a thermal model that dictates the surface temperature of the line and the heat flow out of the line with a coolant. So the resistances of the line are dependent on the surface temperature of the line and the cooling path temperature. The temperature of the line is held constant by a fixed boundary condition that specifies the ideal temperature of the cooling system. So in the model on the bottom portion of the slide, we have both our thermal um, domain and our electrical domain represented. So this 
port right here, this solid red box, represents the port to the cooling media. We communicate our temperature and our heat flow of the line with that media. Um, every, all of the line is encapsulated in this red box to represent that the entire electrical model is cryogenically cooled. And the electrical model that is located inside of the box has these blue boxes right here. This represents the port to the rest of the electrical system where we're communicating the voltage and the current going in and out of the line um, with the rest of the components in the electrical system. So we model the line using equations for cold and cooling. First, we need to define the maximum current rating of the line, the resistivity of the line, and the electric field of the line. Um, so first I'm going to go through the electrical domain modeling of the HDS line, and then I'll discuss the thermal domain modeling. So first we have to calculate the critical current of the line. This critical current is a function of the critical current at 20 Kelvin multiplied by a function of the temperature of the surface of the line, which is TL, and divided by the critical current of the superconductor, which is TC. We use this value of the critical current to help us determine the resistivity of the cable. This resistivity rho is a function of the electric field multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the copper portion of the line, ACU, and divided by the critical current, IC. The electric field is calculated as a function of a reference electric field value for the critical current, E naught. This value is multiplied by the current flowing through the cable I divided by IC, and this function is multiplied by an index value for the superconductor, which is denoted as N. Now that we have those values determined, we can calculate the values for the pi line resistance, inductance, and capacitance. In this model, we also have these uh, resistances RL, which denote the uh, current leads for the HGS line. However, in this model, we are, uh, we are assuming that the value of the current leads is constant, no matter what kind of cooling there is. In reality, this isn't true, um, but here we're just not modeling that portion of the line. We're only focusing on the pi line models right now. So we have our resistance uh, for our pi, which is the pi line resistance, is a function of the electric field multiplied by the current going through the line divided by the critical current, IC, and this function is multiplied by this index value of the superconductor. This whole term is divided by the current flowing through the line, I. The inductance, L pi, of the line is a function of the log of the outer radius of the electrical super or the electrical conductor divided by the inner radius of the HGS annular electrical cable. Same thing for uh, C pi, which is the capacitance of the pi line circuit. It's a function of the log of the outer radius of the HGS electrical conductor and A, which is the inner radius of the HGS electrical cable. Now that we have the electrical components modeled, we can discuss the thermal model. We developed in for this presentation three different medias that we cooled the line for. We cooled the line for liquid hydrogen, liquid nitrogen, and hydrogen gas. So first I'll go through our liquid hydrogen and liquid nitrogen models. So we determine we have to first determine the heat transfer coefficient of the model. This heat transfer coefficient is a function of the nucleophilic curve for liquid hydrogen. This determines the heat generated by the line, where H, which is the heat transfer coefficient, is a function of Q, which is the heat flow generated by the cable, divided by delta T rho, which is the difference in temperature between the cable and cooling media. So we use the nuclear boiling curve to determine this piecewise function shown right here, where the um, pieces of the function are changed as a function of delta T rho. So we use one function when delta T rho is below 3 Kelvin, another function when delta T rho is between 3 and 100 Kelvin, and then we just hold the heat transfer coefficient constant at 1000 when delta T rho is above 100 Kelvin. 
Next, we have our liquid hydrogen heat transfer model. Again, we calculate this heat transfer coefficient as a function of the nucleate boiling curve for liquid nitrogen. Uh, this helps us determine the heat generated by the line again, where H is the heat transfer coefficient, Q is the heat flow generated by the cable, and delta T rho is the difference in temperature between the cable and the cooling media. For liquid nitrogen, this piecewise function is, changes its equation based on the value of delta T rho. When delta T, we use one function, one delta T rho is below 11 Kelvin, and another function when delta T rho is above 11 Kelvin. Now that we have the heat transfer coefficients for those two medias modeled, we can discuss the rest of the liquid cooling thermal functions. So I mentioned delta T rho a lot in the heat transfer coefficient um, definition for the models. We calculate delta T rho as a function of the heat generation divided by uh, the heat transfer coefficient. The heat flow out of the line is defined as the as rho, which is the resistivity of the um, cable multiplied by IC squared divided by the geometry of the cable, where P is the perimeter of the cable, and ACU is the cross-sectional area of the copper portion of the line. We also add an additional heat due to potential additional fault as well in this function, and we divide it by the heat transfer coefficient. Uh, the heat flow out of the line is a function of the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by delta T rho, and we add in a cold end cooling term, which is QCE. QCE is a function of the temperature of the cooling bath media, which is TB, multiplied by the square root of kappa, which is the average effective radial thermal conductivity of the electric cable, the ACU, which is the cross-sectional area of the copper portion of the line, P, which is the perimeter of the line, and H, which again is the heat transfer coefficient. The gas cooling utilizes both delta T rho and another term for uh, delta T z. This is because gas cooling does not have um, uniform cooling along the line. The cooling of the line varies as a function of distance from the gas coolant inlet. So we calculate this as, as first the temperature of the line at every point. So because we're calculating it as a function of the distance from the coolant inlet, we decide that Z0 is the point at which we're inletting the gas coolant, and then we increment Z as every value above that. Um, so delta Tz is a function of the inlet coolant temperature plus the heat flow multiplied by the distance between the coolant and where we're analyzing the temperature at, divided by the velocity of the gas coolant, V, multiplied by CPV, which is the heat capacity of the gas coolant, and multiplied by 2 pi times the geometry of the cable, which RC is the inner radius of the cable, and R0 is the outer radius of the cable. Um, now that we have the temperature at a certain point, we calculate delta Tz as the temperature at a given point uh, minus the inlet temperature of the gas coolant, and the total heat uh, difference in heat between the cable and the cooling media is a function of delta Tz and delta T rho. Now that we have all of the thermal models and, and the electrical models done for the HTS cable, we simulate them. Um, so we set up a circuit that matched experiments run on previous HTS tapes to validate the model's behavior. So we did was we um, applied a current source at the HTS line. We ramped the current from zero to twice the value of IC or the critical current, and we ground the line on the other end. We tested this for liquid hydrogen, liquid nitrogen, and gas hydrogen cooling. Okay, first we have our results for the liquid hydrogen and liquid nitrogen um, case. So we apply the ramp where from zero to two IC to determine where thermal failure would occur for each cooling media. Uh, this helps us see where, um, this is helpful so that we can determine the sizing of the line, what sort of protection is needed, um, and the like. So both lines have a critical current of 3,700 amps. 
um, liquid hydrogen remained, which is the blue line in this figure here, it remained in, cooled um, in the cryogenic region until nearly twice the value of IC. This is really helpful for us um, in the design and development of a cryogenically cooled electric aircraft. Since we know now that the uh, liquid hydrogen does have a buffer in it that we can use as its own form of protection to protect the uh, cryogenic system from thermal runaway. Um, whereas liquid nitrogen enters film boiling uh, when the line current is at 3.7 kiloamps. So if we were to use liquid nitrogen in our aircraft, we would have to have additional protection. Uh, we'd have to size the line accordingly and probably use a larger line to accommodate for the liquid nitrogen entering um, film boiling at IC, whereas in liquid hydrogen, we could have a smaller line. We wouldn't have to have as a robust of a line because of the properties of the liquid hydrogen and the heat transfer. Here we do the same thing with the um, hydrogen gas, uh, but here I have multiple lines plotted. So I ramp the value of IC to from zero to twice the value of IC. I clipped it here in this plot at 4,000 amps just because I wanted to avoid uh, having to plot the mathematically um, super high numbers that didn't make sense um, that are just a result of the mathematical modeling because the model enters uh, film boiling and thermal instability. So as you can see, I have four different lines plotted where I'm measuring delta T total at, multi at four different line points on the line. One at the gas inlet, which is at zero meters, one at three meters, one at seven meters, and one at 10 meters from gas inlet. So you can see from our line that um, the difference in the temperature of the line varies greatly, especially once we hit about 1500 amps. So this shows that gas cooling is not a viable um, option for a line um, and that we would need to adjust the line sizing accordingly to remain in the cryogenic region and stable um, for at lower currents anyways. So here we model the electric architecture um, for cryogenic cooling. Uh, we have to define mathematical models for the HGS components so that we can couple it to other multi-domain models for other portions of the aircraft. The configuration that we have here, it allows us to model the thermal network, the thermal system, or the thermal portion of the, the HGS model to the rest of the thermal network in the um, electric aircraft. And then we also have um, electrical interfacing so that we can connect the HGS lines to the fuel cells and to the distribution bus bars in the future. This uh, configuration also allows us to integrate to the thermal management and cooling system. Um, this sort of modeling allows us to have early integrated system models. This is helpful at early stages in the development of the aircraft. Um, it allows us to identify the domain boundaries, um, and what kind of responsibilities every component and subsystem has. It also helps us identify original concept gaps and technology needs so that we can aid in communication between disciplines. Um, we saw this with the differences between our cooling medias. So now that we have our HTS lines modeled in an electrothermal manner, we can develop other cryogenic components for the aircraft in the same manner. So we'll develop the bus bar models um, and the Cheetah aircraft, our bus bar models will be made of a cryogenic metal so that we can minimize the size and the weight of the bus bar. Um, and we will also be able to integrate this bus bar and the transmission lines to the rest of the system. This configuration will also allow us to run different sorts of false analysis and failure analysis tests on the aircraft. Um, and we also have to couple this HGS line model to a dynamic fluid media model instead of just assuming a constant temperature boundary condition um, like we did in this case here. All right. So thank you for your attention and I will take any questions in our session. Thanks.